pre-calculus section P4, and this one will be covered over two days. Make sure you grab your yellow lesson objectives. Um, again, we're still working off that same wonderful yellow packet there and seeing all the wonderful things from P4 that we need to know that the state has as standards. And this one actually runs a little over into two pages because our objectives are quite long. We have, I can calculate the slope of a line. I can write an equation for a line using point slope form. I can write an equation for a line using slope intercept form. I can write an equation for a line using general form. Ooh, that's a new one for you. I can graph linear equations in two variables. I can write an equation for a line that is parallel or perpendicular to a given line. I can apply linear equations to real world situations. So please go ahead and rate yourselves before the lesson on those. The only ones that I'm thinking you might have a little bit lower here would be uh, general form, just because you haven't seen it yet. And then some of you might not feel fantastic about, you know, word problem-y things, real world situations, but you're gonna see that this is review, lots and lots of review. So after you've rated yourself before the lesson, tuck that away and now on to the learning so all the good things that we're going to talk about in p4 are definitely prerequisites um, objective here students will be able to use the concepts of slope and y intercept to graph and write linear equations in two variables which you've been doing for years so this is not going to seem like new stuff the slope of a non-vertical line can be found from the coordinates of any two points of a line so we find that whenever we have these screenshots from the book, the book is not putting arrows because most of the time they're giving us a shot that uh, would come from um, looking at some kind of, of graphing device, whether or not it would be a computer or a graphing calculator, and, and they don't have arrows on them. But we know they need the arrows, and that's how you indicate that you have a line and that it's going on forever. So if we want to talk about the slope, we're talking about something that in real-world terms would be called um, the grade. And what it is is the change in y over the change in x. And if you see these little symbols that look like triangles, that is actually the symbol delta and delta means change. So at the college level, we're not writing you know, the formulas that we had for slope from past classes. We would just write something real quick that would look exactly like that, change in y over change in x. That's what the slope is. So the vertical distance that you have gone up in comparison to the horizontal change in distance. So we have to figure that out. And most of the time, what we remember is slope, slope, find the slope, average rate of change. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, because that is how we calculate slope. And we can see that on our vertical and horizontal for our little triangle here. So that's what we use, but like I said, usually, after Algebra 2, the notation for that would be change in y over change in x. Now, the definition of slope. Well, that was what we were just talking about, the slope. And it is signified by m. One of those, well, why'd they use m moments? Well, you can't use s. That's a really bad variable. Some people's s's look a lot like fives. So the slope m of a non-vertical line through the points x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 1, um, x, sub, x sub 1, y sub 1, x sub 2, y sub 2, couldn't get that out for a second there, is one of the most basic things that you first learn about slope is that it's rise over run. And of course, like I just said, we will use that delta symbol, which looks like a triangle, change in y over change in x. And what it comes down to is slope, slope, find the slope, average rate of change, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So that's the song I would teach my, um, well, exponential algebra is what we would call it now, students, or pre-algebra students. And it's because we need to realize that the MCAs, the ACTs, are not going to ask us to find slope, to calculate slope. They're going to ask us to find the average rate of change. That's what slope is, but they don't refer to it as slope. Now, if the line is vertical, 
down there in the denominator, x sub 1 is going to equal x sub 2. And since we can't divide by 0, then that means it's undefined. So the vertical slope is undefined. Now, example 1 says finding the slope of a line. We want to find the slope of the line through the two points. And then we want to sketch a graph of the line, which is kind of silly since they gave us the two points. But we want the slope. So the change in y, and what you want to do is pick a direction. Um, we've talked about this before when we were calculating um, our prerequisites, you know, things like midpoint, distance formula, and all of that. You know, you want to pick a way and, and just stick with it because it becomes a habit. So with slope, I generally start from the right and go to the left. So I need the change in y, which would be negative 2 minus 2 over 4 minus a negative 1. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4, and 4 minus a negative 1 is 5. So there is my slope, and that is negative 4 fifths. Now, I just need to graph it. So I have to remember how to graph negative 1, 2, which would mean go to the left 1 unit and up 2 units. And then 4, negative 2 would be to the right 4, and down 2 units. And then, of course, Try as best you can to get a straight line. And you absolutely have to put the arrows on. That is the difference between a segment and a line. It's a basic geometry concept that we need those arrows to show that this is going to go on forever. So now I go to B. And I'm finding the slope. And it will be M equals 4 minus 1 over 3 minus 1. So that slope will be 3 halves. And again, all I have to do is graph the points. 1, 1 will be right 1 and up 1. And 3, 4 will be right 3 and up 4. And I put my arrows on there, showing that I'm going in both directions. Now, C gets a little bit tougher. Find the value of x so that the line between the point x3 and 5, 9 has a slope of 2. Now, what they gave me at the end is the slope. So I think backwards. If the slope is 2, how did they get that? Well, they took 9 minus 3, the change in the y's, and they divided that by the change in the x's, 5 minus x. So now I want to simplify that so that I can solve it. And this will be 2 equals 6 over 5 minus x. And then I think, you know what? This would be super fast and easy to do if I just make it into proportion. Most people love proportions because we cross multiply. So I'm going to make that 2 a 2 over 1 and cross multiply. 2 times the quantity 5 minus x equals 6 times 1, which is 6. Then I'll distribute and subtract 10 from both sides and divide by negative 2. And that tells me to make all of this work, x is going to have to be 2. So it's like a little puzzle, but all we do is use the formula that would be appropriate to it. They said we're talking about slope. We use the slope formula, and away we go. So already hit one of the objectives pretty hard here, talking a lot about slope. Now we're going to put that into how do you write the equations for the lines. So point slope form, equation of a line. If we know the coordinates of one point on a line and the slope of the line, then we can find an equation for that line. Now here's what's really important. To use this form, we need a point and we need the slope. It's pretty rare that we get both of those things. But that's what this formula is built for. And again, pre-calculus is about the details. And the details would be, what's the best formula for the information that I've been given? This is the best formula if you are given a point and a slope. So definition, point-slope form of the equation of a line. All right, well, the point-slope form. of an equation of a line. It passes through the point x sub 1, y sub 1, and has a slope of m, is y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. So I look at this formula, slope, point, yep, 
there it is. There's my point. And here's my slope. So point slope form, y minus y sub 1 equals m times the quantity x minus x sub 1. And there are little stars there. It says, great to use when you know a point and a slope, or, and this is the biggie, because this is what's going to happen for us most of the time, any two points on the same line. Because we just showed in the last few problems that it's pretty easy to find slope. So if we use the little slope formula and we now have a slope, and we have two points sitting there in front of us. We have everything we need for point slope form. So this should really be the formula that's used more than any other when you're writing equations for lines. Example two says we're going to be using the point slope form. Use the point slope form to find an equation of a line that passes through the point 2, 5 and has a slope of 3. Well, that is absolutely perfect for our little formula because we have x sub 1 and y sub 1, and we have a slope. So this will be y minus 5 equals 3 times the quantity x minus 2. Now, if the question just said, put it in point-slope form, you could stop right there. The problem with point-slope form is there are an infinite amount of points on a line. Therefore, there'd be an infinite amount of point slope form answers that you could possibly have. Since they don't want to put an infinite amount of answers in the back of the book, they typically take point slope form and change it into slope intercept form. So we'll have to distribute the 3 and then add the 5 and get y equals 3x minus 1. And that's what we'll see in the back of the book. Because again, you know, we can't have an infinite amount of answers. All right, we go to B. Point and slope. Cool. That's what we need. So we have our point as x sub 1 and y sub 1, and we have our slope. But this time, it would be a y minus a negative 4, which would be very silly to write down. And of course, it would not be simplified. So we're going to change that to y plus 4. 2 times the quantity x minus a negative 3 would be x plus 3. Now, if it said point slope form, we'd be done. But usually, we'll keep going and write that in slope intercept form. So you distribute the 2 and get 2x plus 6. You subtract 4 from both sides, and you have y equals 2x plus 2. Let's keep cruising. Uh oh, this is what they do. They take something away, and then we have to do a little more work. This one has the point that doesn't have the slope. Oh, rats. Wait a second. We know how to find slope. Piece of cake. So we find the slope. That's how we start. 4 minus 8 over negative 1 minus a negative 3. And that will be negative 4 over negative 1 plus 3, which would be 2 we have ourselves a slope of negative 2. And now we have two points from which we can choose. And it doesn't make any difference which one you choose. Remember, there's an infinite amount of points on a line. I'm going to go ahead and go with the first one for my x sub 1, y sub 1. So y minus 8 equals my slope of negative 2 times the quantity x plus 3, because that would be x minus a negative 3. Now, if you use the negative 1, 4, of course, your point slope form is going to look different than mine at this point. However, if we keep going and put this into slope intercept form, there is only one slope intercept form. Again, that's why that's the one we're going to see in the back of the book. So we keep going by distributing, adding 8 to both sides. And y equals negative 2x plus 2. Beautiful. All right. Well, d doesn't look so challenging anymore because I know I can find slope. Difference between the two y's, 3 minus 1 over negative 2 minus 6. That'll be 2 over negative 8. That's negative 1 fourth. Ooh, little fraction. We can deal with that. Fractions are our friends. 
Now, I get to pick which one of these I want to use. And again, I'm just going to take the first one. Why choose one point over another? Sometimes people like to choose the, the point that already has the negatives in it, because then when you put it into the formula, it becomes a plus. Minus a negative is a plus. But either way, we'll get there. So y minus 1 equals negative 1 fourth times the quantity x minus 6. y minus 1 equals negative 1 fourth x. And then if you distribute that 1 fourth, negative and negative will make it a positive 6 fourths. So you could come over here, and in your head there, you could reduce those by 2 and get 3 halves. And then, oh, I should do this so that nobody thinks that's something that's part of my solution. That's just a thinking step out there. And then we'd have to add 1. And 1 is, of course, 2 halves, because when you're dealing with fractions, you must have a common denominator. I forgot to write my little x there. So y equals negative 1 fourth x plus 5 halves. No decimals, always fractions. Fractions are perfect. Decimals are one of those things that we do if we have to answer a real life problem. All right. We hit that pretty hard and fast. Slope, point slope form. And now we have slope intercept form equation of a line. Slope intercept form of equation would be the first one that you were taught when you went back and, and first started graphing lines. And the slope intercept form of an equation is going to use both the slope and the y intercept. Now, this one is, is should not be used as often as uh, point slope form, and that's because it's it's pretty rare that you're given both the slope and the intercept. So the blank of an equation of a line with slope m and y-intercept 0b is, well, that's our slope-intercept form right there. I wrote too big. Slope-intercept form of an equation of a line with slope m and y-intercept 0b is y equals mx plus b. There it is, slope intercept. Now, a couple of little stars there. Solve the point slope form equation for y to receive the slope intercept form. So, if we need those pieces, using the slope intercept form, it says write an equation of a line with a slope of 3 that passes through the point y, y, negative 1, 6 using slope intercept form. Where I was going with that is, you know, the y intercept is something that we need. So if I'm going to use slope intercept form, is that where I should be starting with a problem like this? And what I see is, well, I have a point and a slope. I shouldn't be starting with with slope intercept form because that's not the inter intercept. The intercept would be zero something as a point. So I have to start with my point slope form. And I'm going to work that into slope intercept form, which is what we were just doing on the other problems. So this will be y minus 6 equals 3 times the quantity x plus 1. We'll distribute the 3 and we'll add 6 to both sides. So now, we wrote an equation of the line, and we put it in slope-intercept form. Looks fantastic. And we do want to graph it. Paused for just a second there so I could make those um, grids a little bit darker. It's getting pretty hard to see those little blue lines in there. They were way too, way too shaded for me there. So um, y equals 3x plus 9. What we would do is say, oh, this is y equals mx plus b. So my slope is 3, and my y-intercept is 0, 9, because that's always my b value back there. And the slope we want to have as a fraction, because we want that to be rise over run. So we would start at the point 0, 9 up here, and then we would say to ourselves, self, I'm supposed to go up 3 and to the right 1. But that's off my grid. And Cedar Holmes said that's not okay, because 
This is pre-calculus, and in pre-calculus, we're expected to use the grid that we see. So we use the slope backwards, and what we do is go down 3 and left 1, because down 3 and left 1 would have two negatives, and that would make it positive. So down 3 and left 1 gives me a few of these to aim at. If you're not very good at drawing straight lines like me, it helps when you make more points. And there it is. y equals 3x plus 9. Now in B, it says write an equation of the line with a slope of 1 half that passes through the point 1, 2, ordered pair 1, 2, using the slope-intercept form. Again, that's not where we start. The best formula for the information we have right now is going to be point-slope. So in point-slope, it'll be y minus 2 equals 1 half times the quantity x minus 1. We would distribute the 1 half, and then we would add 2. But adding 2 on this side means we have to figure out how many halves that's going to be on the other side, and that would be 4 halves. So y equals 1 half x plus 3 halves. So now we have to figure out, all right, where do we start and where do we go from there? Well, y equals mx plus b. Or go back to the original information that you've been given. Either one. But our slope here is 1 half. And our b value, our y-intercept, will be at 0, 3 halves. And notice you don't write that as b equals 3 halves. We're beyond that. We need to know that that's a point. That point is at 0, 3 halves. So either way, you can go back and use the original. Hey, you got your first point at 1, 2, and the slope is 1 half. Or you could start at 0, 1 and a half, and go up 1 and write 2. Again, I'm trying to give myself a few of these to aim at. And I make sure I draw my arrows on there. And away we go. So, just as I had talked about earlier, most of the time to start our equations for lines, we're going to be starting with the point slope form. And then we make use of that slope intercept form. So this chart that you see here in the green and blue, uh, what you see is, hey, I know almost all of these. And the one right at the top is the one you haven't seen before, and that's called general form. And general form, what it does is it moves all of the equation over to one side. And then it puts the variables in alphabetical order. So notice the right side of this equation is 0. And like it says, a and b are not both 0. If that were the case, um, this is not going to work. And we do see the special cases down here for vertical lines at x equals a and horizontal lines at y equals b. So general form, ax plus by plus c, which would be the constant, equals 0. Now, that's another one that occasionally you will get um, an instructor at the college level that says A and B must be integers, but we're not going to push that here. Um, we're just going to say, hey, if you want know what general form is, you know that you need to have a zero on one side, and you need to have it in alphabetical order with the variables AX plus BY plus C equals zero. So down here at the bottom, it says the phrase equation of a line represents, well, all of those were lines up there. All of them. Every line can be written in the form ax plus by plus c equals 0, which is the new one, the general form. So we can take any of the slope-intercept forms that we ended with today, and we could put them into general form. So now, this problem says find a general form equation for a line through the pair of points provided. I don't start with general form. General form is how we manipulate it at the end. And I realize, well, I've got two points. I definitely could use point slope if I know what the slope is. So I'm looking for slope. Negative 3 minus a negative 3 over 5 minus 1. Oh! 
it has a slope of zero. Well, it has a slope of zero because it's going to be a horizontal line. Slope is zero. So then I think about horizontal lines, and I imagine it as a karate chop. And if I had to karate chop a giant X and Y Cartesian coordinate plane and I karate chopped it, I would cross the Y axis. So this needs an equation Y equals something. And it is not a mystery what that something is because it's right there. Y is always negative 3. And there it is. Now, it said, find a general form of the equation. And I know we want to walk away from this one because we're like, got it, it's a horizontal line, it's y equals negative 3. But general form has to have a 0 on one side. And it has to be in the order ax plus by plus c. Well, we don't have an x. So the y would come first. And now it's in general form. B. Let's start the same way. Let's find the slope. Negative 1 minus a negative 8 over 4 minus a negative 3 will be negative 1 plus 8, which is 7. And then 4 minus a negative 3 is going to be 7. And 7 divided by 7 is 1. I like that as a slope. And then I get to pick which of these two I'd like to use for my point slope form. And I am going to go with the two negatives this time because that will change everything into positives y minus a negative 8 will be y plus 8 equals 1 times x plus 3. But now I have to switch gears, because normally I would really like to put that into slope-intercept form. But I'm not supposed to do that this time. Now it's supposed to be general form. So I want to have my x, my y, and then my constant. And I see over here that x is positive. I think I'm going to keep x positive. So I'm going to subtract y and subtract 8 from both sides. And make it 0 equals x minus y minus 5. Now, it could have brought everything over the other side. And that would be general form also. But again, you run into the occasional professor that says, I always want your A value to be positive and an integer. Because they don't like that negative in that first spot. Again, we don't care. We want you to have general form as having everything on one side, x, y, constant, and a 0 on the other side. Because this is the first time you've seen general form. All right. Graphing linear, linear equations in two variables. Linear equation in x and y is an equation written in the form ax plus by equals c. The big deal about why this is linear is because the highest power of the x is a 1. That's how we have something that's linear. That's why when we graph y equals mx plus b, it's x to the first, we get a line. So x to the first, linear. a and b are not both 0. If b is 0, then it would say ax equals c. Well, if I'm going to karate chop the x-axis, I notice my hand is going in a vertical motion, up and down. If a is 0, then it says by equals c. We'll be able to solve that for y, and if I karate chop that giant y-axis, I see that that's going to be horizontal. So it makes perfect sense. If one of them drops out, you have a special line. The graph of an equation in x and y consists of all pairs x, y that are solutions of the equation. For example, 6, negative 2 is a solution of 2x plus 3y equals 6. I want to make sure. To make sure, we substitute. This goes in for x, this goes in for y, and let's see if it works. 2 times 6 plus 3 times negative 2, does that really equal 6? Is 12 minus 6 equal to 6? Yep, or doodle. There it is. So... It's just checking to make sure that it works. And again, that's how you know that you have a solution. So the y-intercept is a point, 0, y, or b, where the graph of the line intercepts the y-axis. talked about that earlier. And also about the fact that we want to make sure that we are writing that as an ordered pair. We have to put all this information together. You have to show that you understand how all of this is placed on the graph. 
to find the y-intercept, set x equal to 0 and solve for y. Yeah, you can do that. Um, you could also put it into slope-intercept form and find it that way. So if you need the x-intercept, the x you set the y equal to 0. If you need the y-intercept, you set x equal to 0. So the x-intercept is the point x0 where the graph of the line intercepts the x-axis. So like I was just talking about before, you need the y-intercept, set x equal to 0. You need the x-intercept, set the y equal to 0 and solve. So different things that we can do. Now, the reason that we do those is because this is a really quick way to graph. And it is called the intercept method. In some books, you'll hear it referred to as the zero method. And one of the things you do is you just realize, well, hey, if I put a zero in for x, then this is gone, and it's going to say 3y equals 6. 3 times something equals 6, that something is 2. And then if I put a zero in for y, this is going to say 2 times something is 6. That something is 3. So I typically taught that to my little Algebra 1 students as saying the thumb method. If x is 0, then take your big thumb and cover up the 2x because it'll be gone. It, it was times 0. It's not there anymore. And look at what you have left. 3y equals 6. Then if you need the other one, take your thumb y equals 0, take your thumb and cover that up, and then we'll end up getting ourselves, and put a little fingernail, there we go, a little red nail polish there. Um, we'll have 2 times something equals 6, and that something is 3. So we have those two points, 0, 2, and 3, 0. And yeah, I didn't get it perfectly straight there that time. Uh, but there it is. So very quick way to graph using that intercept method of graphing. Now, graphing with a graphing utility. You're going to find that the book doesn't call them graphing calculators, and that's because there are a lot of apps that you can get um, on, online that will also do graphing for you, like Desmos. So to draw a graph of an equation using a grapher, rewrite the equation in the form y equals. And with our graphing calculators, that's incredibly important. You have to have it in slope-intercept form. So it's an expression that has x in it. And then enter the equation into the graphing calculator and select an appropriate viewing window. And then press the graph key. So over here, they're showing us what the window would be. And this one, the negative 10 to 10 window, on our calculator comes from zoom 6, that negative 10 to 10. That's what we press if we want that. So, um, like it says, example 4 says use a graphing utility. It would be seriously silly to do it, but we're going to. You know, we just did 2x plus 3y equals 6, so we have our zeros. Again, a 0 in the x would give us 2, and a 0 in the y would give us a 3, and it's already graphed, and I didn't have to use a graphing utility to get it done. But let's just say we really wanted to use the graphing calculator. So right now we have 2x plus 3y equals 6. If we want to put that in the graphing calculator, we need y equals mx plus b. So we're going to subtract 2x from both sides, and we're going to divide by 3. Oops, I'm starting to run into the next problem here, so let me go over here. So y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 2. All right, I want to see that on my graphing calculator. So I punch y equals. y equals negative 2 thirds x. And whenever we're putting fractions, Oh, let me clear that out. Whenever we're putting fractions in, we want to put parentheses around the fraction. We have to remember where x is. That's by that green alpha key. And we go back and we see, oh, I still had the plus 2. i got to put the plus 2 on there. So I need to put plus 2. Enter. And then, like I said, if you're going to use that standard negative 10 to 10 window, you can hit zoom, 6, 
and it's going to graph it for you without having to hit enter or anything like that. And we can see, yeah, that's what we had. If we want to make sure, we can always check the table, and that's going to be the second button and graph for the table. Oh, look, there's my 0, 2, and my 3, 0. They're in there. Well, of course they are. You know, That was definitely the quick way to graph. I'm going to clear this out, and let's go back to that note packet. Like I said, it's, it's, it's silly. Usually with the big number problems, that's when we you know, might grab a graphing calculator and do that. But this, this is pretty silly. So figure P.27, this bit right here, says the graph of 2x plus 3y equals 6. The points 0, 2, which is the y-intercept, and 3, 0, the x-intercept, appear to lie on the graph. We, we saw it from the table. It's not appear to be. They, they do. They're there. Um, they're solutions to the equation, and that provides visual support that the graph is correct. Now, for B, we've got this little thing about viewing window here. And it says the viewing window, negative 4, 6 by negative 3, 5 in figure P2, P.27 means that they had the X's set from negative 4 to 6 and the Y's set from negative 3 to 5. Now, that, of course, we can change. So if we are asked to change the window, we go up to our graphing calculator button that says um, window, and we take a look at it. Oh, it went to the second function. That happens sometimes. Sometimes there's a little glitch in this window there. And you can change the smallest x value, the highest x value. You can change the scale, go by twos, go by threes, whatever you need to do. And you can change the y minimum and the y max. And then again, the Y scale. We don't mess with this too much. It has uh, more to do with our inequalities than anything else. But they're just telling us, just remember that's there. Um, it's a feature. And if we need to change the window, big deal. We'll change the window. That's, that's just what we'll do. So we have all kinds of ways to graph something like 8x plus y equals 44. And one of the easiest things, again, to do when you have it in, this is called standard form. If you remember that one, that is ax plus by equals c. So the easiest way, the quickest way, when you have standard form, is to find your zeros. So that's the thumb method one. If I put 0 in for x, that means I'm going to get 44 for y, which, of course, tells me I cannot go by 1s on this problem. And then if I put a 0 in for y, I'm going to get 44 divided by 8, which will be 11 halves. Now, 11 halves, totally fine. You know, we can hit fit 5 and a half on our x's, but we're going to have to do something about our, our y. So I'm going to put the x over here and the y over here, and I will go by 1s on my x-axis. But I have to determine how to best use my space if I have to graph 44. So I start thinking. I've got 10 of them there. 44 divided by 10 would be 4.4. No way am I going to label those by 4.4. So instead, I'm just going to round up to 5 and have each of these go by 5. Now, it's going to be really hard to read if I write it on every single one. So I think I'm going to go every 2 and mark it as 10s, like so. That way, people can make out what it was I was doing. Now, what you can't do is not give any indication of new intervals over there and just assume that everybody knows all the changes you made. That's a big no-no. So we have to make sure that we have those intervals and that those intervals are the same length every time. Notice went by 5. So 5, 10, 15, 20, all the way up. Went by 1s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You make those decisions and you stick with them. So we have 0, 44, which would be pretty close to that. And then 5 and a half, 0, about right there. And yeah, my not so straight line. So. Smartboard makes it interesting. I could cheat and use our straight line there, but um, 
kind of in the same situation. Oh, sometimes students use uh, the lid of their calculator to draw straight lines. That works out pretty good if you line that up right. Um, so, you know, the nicer it looks, the better. That's what we want to make sure we're doing those details. So that was day one. We can't get through all of this good stuff. I mean, we talked about a lot of things that were part of the objectives. We calculated the slope of a line. Um, we were writing an equation using point slope form, slope intercept form. Uh, we saw general form. We did some graphing and two variables. So it looks like for day two, we're going to have to focus on writing an equation for a line that's parallel or perpendicular to a given line and seeing those real world situations. Those are the big objectives that we have left here. So whenever we have the real world situations, you definitely want to have that graphing calculator handy. There's the assignment for P4 day one. Thanks, everybody.